Cherubs, at this year's Venice Biennale, the artist Christophe Bouchel displayed a fishing vessel. In April of 2015, this ship sank off the coast of Libya, killing more than 700 migrants who were looking for a better way of life. It was the deadliest shipwreck in the Mediterranean in living memory. The installation of the boat was entitled Barca Nostra, which means our boat. I personally and embarrassingly didn't know much about it until it made the headlines at the Biennale. The Venice Biennale, if you don't know, is a prestigious art show that brings together artists from around the world. So to display a ready-made like this at this show is a big deal. In particular, in this location, the port of Venice. Venice with its history of naval power and shipbuilding. The artist was not interviewed about the work, but his collaborator Maria Chiara Trapini explained the message of the work. We are living in a tragic moment without memory. We all watch the news and it seems so far away. Someone is dead at sea and we change the channel. Others though, like Lorenzo Tondo of The Guardian, assert that Bouchel's decision risks creating yet another celebration of the nostalgia of tragedy without the corresponding act of conviction in the present. So this is what I want to discuss today. The relationship between art, history, and memory. In another work of art proposed for some time next year, the artist Mark Quinn will be placing two cubes designed by Sir Norman Foster, the architect of the Gherkin, each holding one ton of human blood. One of these cubes will contain the blood of refugees, and the other will contain the blood of non-refugees, including some celebrities like Kate Moss and Paul McCartney. Each donor will record a short video as well, and the piece will raise money for charities. No one will know which cube has which blood. It will be displayed first outside of the New York City Public Library. Because nobody will know which cube is which, it fulfills one of the intentions of the piece. To say that blood is blood, and the most valued among us is ultimately no different than the least valued among us. The piece itself will move freely across a number of borders as it has plans to travel through Europe, Africa, and the Mideast. And Quinn hopes that this will force people to critically think about the refugee crisis and our shared humanity. I imagine that this work will inspire similar criticisms to Barca Nostra. I want to focus on the intention of the artist in both cases here. They claim that this will help us remember our current refugee crisis to ensure that this part of our history isn't forgotten. Quinn calls our attention to how other works have helped our shared historical narrative remember tragedy. You remember Guernica, he said, because Picasso painted it. Otherwise, it's just another battle in the Spanish Civil War. To me, this refugee crisis is something that should remain in the collective memory of the world. He's got a point. I teach history, and I'd be hard-pressed to name another bombing in the Spanish Civil War. And the reason is Picasso. I know about the bombing of Dresden because of Slaughterhouse-Five. I certainly wouldn't know anything at all about the historically inconsequential Battle of Troy if it weren't for Homer. So this forces me to ask the question, what role does art play in the construction of historical knowledge? To start with, we should probably discuss the goals of historical knowledge. It might be easy for us to reduce this to a simple statement about how history wants to be the record of what happened in the past. But if you've thought about this for longer than a few minutes, you've no doubt come to the understanding that history will only ever reflect a tiny fraction of what happened in the past. It's edited. It has to be. What if you sat down and tried to tell the story of last year? Where would you start? What events would you focus on? Where would most of your narrative take place? As soon as you answer any of these questions, you've decided to leave something out. If you focus on politics, you'll leave out the experience of working class people. If you focus on wars, you'll leave out the peace. If you focus on North America, Europe, or Russia, you're leaving out South America, Africa, Australia, and so on. And then once you've decided on these areas of focus, you'll need to research them. And what will constitute as reliable research for you? Personal first-hand accounts, or will those be unreliable or too biased? Will you keep your research to only that which can be quantified? If so, think about what will be sacrificed. I think you get the point. History needs to have a very different definition of truth than we're used to. In this way, it can't truly be a record of what happened in the past. It's more like a story we tell ourselves about what happened in the past. As the historian John Lewis Gaddis once wrote, history, like cartography, is necessarily a representation of reality. It's not reality itself. So then what are the goals of historical knowledge? Well, there's loads of answers to that question, and I won't be able to address them all, so I'll just focus on one that matters to us discussing the installation of art at the Biennale and Quinn's proposed blood cube. Historical knowledge aims to give us a shared narrative and understanding of our past. It creates communities through that necessary editing. It gives us a heritage. And this isn't a new perspective on history. We've been aware of this tenuous relationship of history to truth and how it could be used for a long time. I'm reminded how Henry VII, after ascending the throne, 
Stone, following the long War of the Roses, commissioned historians to find evidence that he descended from King Arthur in order to solidify his shaky claim to the throne. The parades and pageantry of his government focused on that mythical heritage and built a sense of shared English identity. He needed to tell that story to build his community. Side note, I'm sorry, but I have a hard time understanding anything if I don't first relate it to the early modern period. Back to the question at hand, which has become, what role does art play in building a heritage or a community? Well, art communicates through the senses, and the role our senses play in improving our memories is intuitive. I'm a teacher, and it should come as no surprise to you that when I'm in class, I use paintings and images to help anchor concepts for my students. And this isn't some recent understanding of how our brain works. In the 13th century, John of Genoa justified having representational art in churches by claiming that the mystery of carnation and the examples of the saints may be more active in our memory through being presented daily to our eyes. I know, I know, I have a problem. My knowledge base is early modern. I wish I could be more like Mike Rugnetta and use examples from pop culture, but this is the furniture I'm working with in my brain. The point is, images work really well as a mnemonic device. History is a story, and memorable stories have emotional tension. Art happens to be exceptional at communicating emotion. The expressive theory of art argues that its central purpose is to communicate emotion. John of Genoa, trust me, he was a really big deal in the 13th century, went on to say that images excite feelings of devotion, these being aroused more effectively by things seen than by things heard. So the church realized early on that art could be used to promote historical narrative. Hearing the stories and then seeing them illustrated gives the information two pathways into our memory by leveraging emotion. And what is history if not a shared memory? So we've answered our question, kind of. Art helps build historical knowledge by leveraging sense perception and emotion to build a shared memory for our communities. These communities could be hyper-local and constructed through a mural or a piece of architecture or a portrait of a valued member of the community. Or art can help build larger communities and national identities through history paintings, architecture, theater. Or art can help build religious communities through paintings, architecture, or ceremony. At its best, sometimes a work of art can actually help create a global rather than simply local community. Many of the world's great religious texts approach that goal. Works like the Iliad, Guernica, and artists like Ai Weiwei, Banksy, Maria Abramovich, and Beyonce have all had global appeal and helped build communities at a global scale. See, I'm trying to have more current references, and I believe in those references. I used to claim that Zay Frank was the greatest artist of the 21st century, but last year changed my mind. That video in the Louvre put Beyonce firmly on top, and I think that Homecoming is going to make sure that she stays there for a bit. In those cases, art blurs the line between documentation or narrative of the past and the art actually becomes the historical event in itself. The historical event of the work itself then serves as a signpost for the part of our past that the artist wants us to remember. The silence and reflection that we experience when we perceive a work of art or read a piece of literature puts a dent in our memory, and by placing the work like Barco Nostra at an international art exhibit, the artist must be hoping to put a large shared dent in our collective memory. So this is clearly what Christophe Bouchel and Mark Quinn are attempting here. They want these works of art to be a historical event in themselves. If the loss of life itself didn't hit you, maybe a work of art can. The artists want to provoke highly emotional reactions and the event of the work to imprint itself on our collective memories and to move us towards a global community. Whether this will help us avoid changing the channel this time, or it only represents the nostalgia for tragedy, I'll leave that up to you. What do you think? What role can the arts play in recording history and guiding us towards a more empathic future? Let me know in the comments below, and if you like this video and want to see more like it, please consider subscribing. I put out a new video about the middle of every month. Thank you for watching.